Hello everyone and welcome uh, to another awful weekly recap of One Piece. I'll just quickly go on, uh, go over what I said. We're still in lockdown, haven't been to the comic shop. I got my COVID vaccine today, uh, like literally half an hour ago. Uh, I've been reading a lot of Shonen Jump because I subscribed to the... Uh, uh, I feel bad for my good old friend down at Impact Comics. I got into buying a lot of manga from him over the last uh, couple of months. As soon as we hit lockdown, um, and he didn't have the next two volumes that I needed, I, I found the Viz site, which is like $2 a month, and it literally has like all the Shonen series and all this other manga. And I'm, I'm going to try and keep buying One Piece, because I started out, I wanted to have it, I think I've said this previously, I want to have a nice bookshelf full of books that I can look at and maybe lend people. But, like, being able to read all these series online, I, I, there's there's no reason to, like, buy the physical copies from the bookstore. And I feel really bad about that because he's my friend and I like Impact Comics and I like these comics. But, anyway, so I, was, I started to talk about uh, Jujutsu Kaisen was what I was talking about. I saw the anime like everyone and I didn't like it all that much. I thought it was fine. Like... Shonen battle anime with monsters and fighting and special abilities. That's my jam. That's like what I'm into. But I just didn't think Jujutsu Kaisen was that good. So I'm reading the manga now just to see if there's something different in the manga. Um, maybe the story continuation after the anime ended is better. We'll see. So far I only read... Um, it's like the, the pre-chapters. There's like chapter zero... A couple of 0 0.1.2.3 chapters. I don't know how that ties into anything apart from the fact that it's got some of the same characters in it. But we'll see. Then I started to talk about Sakamoto Days. Which I described as being basically John Wick. Except instead of like John Wick leaving the biz. To like live with a woman that he fell in love with. And she died of natural causes. In this version he falls in love. Leaves the biz. Has a daughter with her gets overweight and is running a convenience store but he's still like the world's most deadly assassin and there's a guy i think he might have been a student or like an associate and for some reason he needs to bump him off but he can't because sakamoto is so good and they become friends and the series is about him living life as like an ordinary dude when he's like the world's greatest assassin except he's chubby and overweight and unsuspecting I haven't read that much of it, but it was kind of funny. The, those kind of slice of life gag mangas aren't really my thing, but like I'll read it every now and then. There's only what thirty-seven chapters, so I'm, I might read it every now and then until I'm finished, and then just keep up with it weekly. <laughs> uh, Mashal Magic and is it uh, Mashal Mash? I don't know. Like I, the character's name is Mash, so I don't know what Mashal means. Maybe it's just muscles. Mashal Magic and Muscles is by far the best thing I've read all week. Essentially, it's Harry Potter. Except instead of having any magic power, Harry Potter is like a muggle. He has no magic, but he's extremely jacked. Like, he lived his life eating protein for every meal. So, instead of doing magic, he's forced to, like, use his muscles to, like, imitate anything that the wizards do. So when, like, the wizard rides a broom... He just, like, you know, throws the broom as fast as he can and then uses his legs to, like, jump after it so he lands on it and it kind of appears like he's flying. Um, you know, instead of just casting magic spells, he just, he just full-on punches people in the face. That's how he solves a lot of his problems. Is literally, whenever he gets into a standoff with, like, an evil wizard or, like, a Slytherin-ish wizard who's, like, you know, looking down on him or looking down at people and, and being a bastard... Punching them in the face or in the gut is, is like, his go-to move. And it's hilarious. Like, it's amazing. He for, the, for this weird circumstance, he has to go to, like, the wizard school and become, like, the top wizard for, for this reason. Um, and they have the class, uh, the houses. So there's, like, the, the, the snooty ones, the other ones, and, like, the good guy ones. And, yeah... It, it's it's Harry Potter, except Harry has no magic and just punches people in the face constantly. <laughs> it's it's really cool. Um, Undead Unluck, I started reading a little bit of that. The basic premise is that there's a girl who has the power of unluck. 
So if she touches people with like bare skin, and I think it's into that like how she touches them. Like if she touches them because she likes them, like she hugs you because you like she really likes you. That's worse than if she was just to brush past you or, or, you know, touch you without knowing you. Like there has to be some sort of feeling involved. And once she touches you in, in the, with skin, you become really unlucky or something happens to you that's really unlucky. So like she's lived life where she hugged her parents goodbye and then they died in the plane crash. Uh, and she's going to kill herself because she's kind of sick. She, she reads like shoujo manga and she all these romance series. And she realized, one of the reasons anyway, like k killing people accidentally is like a big reason as well. But also knowing that she'll never have that uh, romantic fling, those like stories she reads in her manga, those romantic stories. She's never going to have that because if she ever tries to like cuddle up to a boy, they'll probably die from, you know, buildings falling on them or something. So she's going to kill herself. Uh, and she meets, he doesn't have a name at first, but she calls him Andy for some reason. And he's like, a z no, he's not a zombie. He's undead. Which is basically a zombie. Uh, he's immortal. If, if he gets injured, like, he regenerates really fast. And he takes a liking to her because he wants to die. He's been alive way too long. He's just kind of overliving. And she, he thinks that he can use her power of unluckiness to do something so unlucky that it actually kills him. Because so far, anything that happens to her, he regenerates. So he wants to get something so unlucky that it will kill the unkillable person. And early on, they kind of find that, I think, he's trying to save her. Like, th there's a bit where he wants her alive because of her power, but he also kind of wants her to live and wants her to do well. So if it comes down to, like, he, he gets captured, he got captured by, like, a military organ, or some sort of weird organization and, like, experimented on once, he's fine with going back and being exper experimented on if she gets to live, that kind of thing. So she's appreciative of him gives him like a kiss on the cheek and something really really bad like a meteor falls out of the sky and lands on the building they're all in uh so early on anyway he kind of gets it in his head that if they fall in love like she falls for him and they like do the mattress congo then that's that's what will trigger like the event that will be able to kill him but he's not about to just you know take her like he's he's a bit of a gentleman like he, he looks like that's him there <coughs> the this dude he looks like gruff and mean or whatever, but he's a gentleman. He's not going to just going to take her. And I think he also knows that to get it to work properly, like she needs to be really into it. Like, like I said before, her feelings and like how much she likes you kind of thing impacts the luck. So if he, if she just kissed him on the cheek, something unlucky would happen. She kissed him because like he was willing to like go down for her, like sacrifice himself so she could live. So there was appreciation there. And that's what caused like the meteor to fall from the sky. So, you know, she needs to, like, really be in love with him for it to sort of happen. So that's that one. Witch Watch, I think I read two chapters of. It's a witch and a guy who is an ogre or something, and he's her bodyguard, and she's a witch, and she's in love with him, and I think he's kind of oblivious to her. It's it's a romantic series that probably has some sort of shonen battle type things. It might be good. I just haven't read enough to, to get into it. Uh, Candy Flurry. Interesting, very, very short. Uh, it's a battle system where a bunch of people ate candies that give them candy power. Like, <laughs> there's like a hundred candies and each candy is like a different candy power. So one person can summon like vanilla ice cream and she's the only person in the world that can summon vanilla ice cream. And another guy has popcorn. Like he, he had popcorn is his weapon. He can manifest popcorn. Actually, that's not true. There's, there's the kids, it seems that were experimented on to get it right, how this would work. And then when it was perfected, they made the 100 candies. So there's a couple of people that have the same power. There's the ones that were experimented on to like work out how to give people powers. And then the ones that got the powers by eating candy. Um, and it's all about like a lollipop user, someone with the power of lollipops destroyed Tokyo. And the main character has lollipop power, but she didn't destroy Tokyo. And they're kind of set up to be like, that's the main crux of the series, like figuring out who was the mysterious person with the lollipop power that destroyed Tokyo. And like I said, it's a very short manga so far, like it's only 18 chapters, and they've already like revealed who they were. So I don't know, it, I, it, it's a little bit interesting. It's like not great, but I kind of get the feeling they've blown their load too quickly. Like they've already kind of given away the big story arc, answer to the big story arc. 
that you'd think should have taken hundreds of chapters. I don't know. Maybe they've got something else in the tank. I just think they've they've rushed too quickly into, like, what seems like the final showdown with, like, the main villain. Anyway, Mago-chan, Go to Destruction. I read one chapter of that only because I didn't have time to read anything else. I mean, it's cute. Me and Roboco, again, I only read one chapter of that. It seems kind of funny. The idea is that it's a world of... I, I'm not going to talk about Mago-chan because I really don't know what the crux is. A, a little girl finds, like, a Cthulhu horror monster. That's as far as I got. Me and Roboco, uh, you live in this world with these robot maids that are really cute. And the little boy, like, wants one because, like, the cute maids, like, will rub his shoulders and, like, get him a glass of Fanta and do stuff for him. And, like, he begs her, her his mother to buy one. And the mother finds out that they... I don't know how she didn't know this. The mother finds out that they do housework and, and clean and cook. So she'll have time to, like, do her hobbies and work and, and all that stuff. I don't know how she didn't know this in this world where, like, sentient robot maids have been around for a while, I guess. Anyway, she tries to buy a maid, and she makes some sort of mistake, and they get this weird maid. Like, she looks, she's, you know, a lot bigger. She's like a big unit kind of thing. She's not like the petite little maids. Also, she doesn't seem to be able to cook and clean and properly. She doesn't know what a lot of stuff is, and she does a lot of, like, physical humor. It's fun. It's funny. Uh, I don't, again, I'm not that big into those comedy slice of life manga, but it seemed cool. Uh, and I started reading a little bit of The Elusive Samurai. Only the first, like, five chapters. It's about a, a, a samurai lord's child. It was, like, next in line to be the... I don't remember it was, Shogun, maybe? Something. Um, and his, his... Someone revolts against his family and kills everyone. He escapes, but, like, this this samurai guy that he liked and respected did a... staged a coup and killed all his family, but he escaped... And he's with these band of people, and apparently, like, his skill is, like, running away, even though that's, like, not a warrior thing to do. But it's something, like, he's got divine powers or something. Like, he's looked upon by a god or something. And is really good at, like, running away and escaping and dodging and stuff. I I'd have to read more to say whether I think it's any good or not. Um, but the art was nice. <clears throat> and uh, Hunter's Guild. I read all of that because it's only nine chapters. You know, it's your standard young person, something happens, you know, monsters attack. They meet a person from a, a guild or an agency or some sort of organization that fights them. Uh, they show promise and they go with the veteran person. So in this case, I think it's just the Hunter's Guild and uh, werewolves are the bad guys. Uh, people turn into werewolves and eat humans and they're monsters and there's a whole guild that fights them. So this little kid... His, his village is, is being attacked by werewolves, so they summon, they hire a hunter, and it's this this chick here. They do a thing where she's like a little girl, but then she turns into a, an older girl when they're fighting. I think it explained why. I think just, just like witches, hex or something. And, you know, they, they do well, and the little kid helps, and he's really good, and he decides to come with her, and they, they head off, and now they're doing like a hunter exam slash a alchemist exam. Uh, hunter exam and that's as far as it got so it's very generic like you've seen it all before it's like beat for beat any of those shonen series like hunter hunter or full metal alchemist or naruto where you know someone gets involved and to fight monsters in an organization and they're doing like the entrance exam basically the only thing is i'm gonna show can i show i don't know if i'll get caught can you get copyright striked on twitch because you show i know shueisha the, the guys who like um, print Shonen Jump are very litigious. I just want to find a picture of the there, yeah, like the werewolves. Like a very like they're not just hairy wolf people. They're like kind of body horror monstrosities. Um, that's kind of cool. like look at that. That's that was my favorite thing about this manga. Really, is is the the way these werewolves are portrayed, because that's kind of terrifying. That's kind of terrifying. Uh, that's all the shonen <coughs> stuff I read this week. Apart from One Piece, obviously. Uh, look, Mr. Three Cosplay, I love it. <laughs> I'm going to just do that. Every week I'm going to look up cosplays of some of the side characters from, from One Piece, because that's really cool. Anyway, so let's get into to One Piece. We started last week. Uh, they're on Whiskey Peak. All the Straw Hats got themselves drunk and passed out, except for, well, actually, apart from everyone. Uh, 
No, Sanji and Usopp, I think, both wore themselves out. Luffy ate himself to death. Zoro didn't. He, he tricked everyone. And it turns out Nami did as well. Nami didn't drink enough to get drunk. She's she's playing the con game as well. Anyway, uh, so Zoro is fighting everyone and he's beating everyone. Nami wakes up as well. There's a really weird... This is probably the worst... Yeah, this is probably the worst part of One Piece in its entirety. Like, all 1,000 chapters. Uh, Luffy wakes up. He sees, like, all these people being beat up. He sees, like, Zoro with his swords out. And I think he asks someone... I, I forget who. Tells him, like, Zoro did it. Zoro just, like, randomly attacked and killed everyone. And Luffy gets upset because these people, like, fed him and were nice to him. And he, he starts a fight with Zoro. And it's not, like, a, a joke fight. Like, it's a serious fight. Like, Luffy even says, like, I'm going to kill you, Zoro. And then it, it, the joke is that eventually someone, like, sorts out, like, tells him what happened. He's like, oh, really? Okay, cool. Like, let's forget about it all. But, yeah, the fact that Luffy really wants to kill Zoro, like, he's right-hand man, like, it, it doesn't make sense. It's not on character. It's not interesting. It's kind of off-putting. Like, considering the last arc, or, yeah, last arc, or the, the Arlong Park arc, anyway. Like, people see Nami kill Usopp. Like, she doesn't, but most people see what appears to be. And everyone's, everyone is saying, like, Nami is, like, part of Arlong's crew. She's betrayed us. Like, all these terrible things. And Luffy's just like, nope, nope, she's a good person. I know it. Like, let's trust her. Let's rescue her. And there's no reason he shouldn't think the same about Zoro. But, like, he comes across, like, a scene where, like, people are hurt and Zoro has his swords out. And one person says, oh, it was Zoro. And that's all it takes for Luffy to, like, 180 turn on Zoro to the point that he's willing to, like, literally kill him. So it's, it's just not very good. Like, I don't know. I've never read anything that says that, you know, it was, like, Oda's editor's... Like, he was forced to do it, or if Oda literally thought that was a good idea. Sponsored by Mountain Dew. But it's probably the worst part of One Piece. Anyway, so the crux of this story now is we find out that Miss Wednesday, who was kind of a, a little, like, comedy villain so far, uh, is actually Princess Vivi of the Alabaster Kingdom. Nefertati, I think, is her. Yeah. Vivi Nefertati. Nefertari. Nefertati? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so, essentially, this Baroque Works organization has been fucking around in her kingdom, and she infiltrated it <coughs> and managed to learn who the mysterious uh, leader of Baroque Works was. Now, this is a secret so hush-hush and so under wraps that anyone who manages to learn it is, is wiped out straight away. So she's managed to learn it, and she's done it by being an agent. Like, she's an agent doing missions for them or whatever, but it, it the higher-ups, for some reason, find out that she is a, a an agent, no, no, like a, a spy, and she's learned their boss's true name, and she needs to be rubbed out. So Mr. Five and Miss... What is Mr. Five's partner called? I forget already. Mr. Five. I know she's a day of the week. But I forget which day. I don't know if it's a day or if it's a holiday. Miss Valentine. There you go. I remember now. Miss Valentine. I always like Miss Valentine's design. She's got that little, like, the 50s? Like, pixie haircut and, like, little dress thing going. They turn up and they basically say they're here on orders to kill uh, Vivi and pretty much anyone else because they've learnt that the identity of their boss, uh, Mr. Zero, is the Warlord Crocodile. And there's a scene where, like, Vivi accidentally, she says, oh, you know, I'm not going to tell you because if I tell you, then, like, your life will be in danger as well. And they're like, oh, yeah, great. Well, don't tell us then if that's the case. And she's like, yeah, yeah, it would be really big trouble if I told you that it was Crocodile. And um, th these the characters are called the Unluckies. It's like a an otter and a vulture or something and they're like they clean up messes you know they, they they're messengers but they also try and they also like, assassinate people every now and then and they turn around they see that these two unluckies like overheard um 
Vivi telling the Straw Hat Pirates about this, so there's, like, no way out now. It's not like she told them, and they can just pretend they never heard, like, the, the society knows. Uh, at first, Miss Valentine and Mr. Five are kind of crap. Because they get, they get beaten very... Well, actually, no, they're always crap. I don't think there's ever come... Uh, I don't think there ever comes a time where they don't lose instantly. They lose here instantly against Zoro and, and uh, Luffy. And then the next arc, I think they lose against Usopp. And it's also kind of funny that their powers are apparently like weaker versions... Like, I don't know how how official this is. I know Oda has stated. But there are a few, like, fruits that are upgraded versions of another. Like, obviously, Ace's uh, Merimerinomi, the fire fire fruit. Um, what's his name? Sakazuki. Aka Inu. Um, he's got the magma fruit. And so, like, magma is, like, melted rocks. So it's hotter and it burns better than fire. So the magma fruit is, like, the upgraded version of the fire fruit. So both Mr. Five and, and Miss Valentine have powers that like other people have upgraded better versions of. And they're both in uh, Doflamingo's crew. So her power is, I think, the Kilo Kilo? No me? And her, she can like change her weight, basically. So she makes herself very light, or then makes herself very heavy. So she makes herself light, she floats up into the sky, and then she makes herself very heavy to come crashing down. Um, and I can't remember what his name is, but there's a dude on Doflamingo's crew who has basically the same power. Except, I don't think he can lower his weight. I think he can only up it. But he can up it much more than... I think 10,000 kilos is her maximum. And this other guy can do much, much, much heavier than that. Uh, and then Mr. Five's, like, the bomb bomb fruit or something. I forget now. Oh, I can just look at it if I just push the back button. That's all I gotta do. Uh, his fruit is called... Bombu Bombu no Mi. So he can make any part of his, his body a bomb. And that's even parts that can be dislocated. So his booger. He can take out a booger and that's part of him. And, and flick it and it makes that explode. And I think breath as well. I think one stage like his breath is explosive. Um, but there's a guy on Doflamingo's crew called Gladius. And he's got a very, very similar power. But he can make other things explode as well. So he can make his, his body explode. The same way that this guy does. So you can punch someone and make your fist explode at the same time. So it's like a fire explosion punch. But you can also touch other things and make them explode as well. So it's it's slightly better. Anyway, anyway. Um, they get defeated. The, the, the Nami makes an arrangement. The, the One of the guys, who was an agent as well, turns out to be Vivi's butler? And like he's he's like her bodyguard, and like he infiltrated Baroque Works with her, so um, you know to protect her. And he f he knows that her life's in danger, and, and Nami kind of makes a deal with him to to look after her in exchange for money. I think this whole thing is because of money. But in in the end, uh, also because they learn from her. That Crocodile is the leader of Baroque Works, which puts their lives in danger as well. I think they're kind of forced to, to go along with her as well a little bit. And I think Luffy just wants to help her because that's kind of Luffy's thing. He, he'll he'll end up wanting to help you if he thinks you're a good person and, and you're in danger. So Vivi joins the crew along with her duck, Karu. I think that's his name. Karu. No? Nefertari. Okay. Nefertari is, is her last name. Oh, yeah, it is Karu. I hate Karu. I always hated Karu. I don't know why. Like, usually I'm not too bad with, like, like fuzzy mascot characters. But I always just hated Karu. Anyway. So, they're all put together... Uh, and they sail towards the next island, which is an island called Little Garden. And I think they meet Robin as well. I think after they, they beat up all Baroque works, I think when they're... I, oh yeah, I should have mentioned, I didn't stream last week. I read all this, and I was going to stream, uh, but as some people might know, a lot of people from Gamacon use this account, we all log in, um, I got logged out. 
accidentally. And I try to log back in and you need a code and only one person on the committee gets those codes. And I think they're indisposed, so they couldn't send me the code, so I couldn't log in. So it's been more than a week since I actually read these. So I've forgotten little, little aspects. But I'm pretty sure they meet Robin for the first time, who kind of just talks to them. I think the first couple of times they meet Robin, she's just like taunting them slash giving them advice. She's she's not necessarily a, a antagonist to them, like she is, but she's also kind of interested in them, so she'll give them hints and stuff. Um, yeah, so they go to Little Garden. Little Garden... I don't like that much. <clears throat> it's not really important to the overall story, apart from the fact it introduces the giant race. It introduces uh, Usopp's obsession with being a brave warrior of the sea. I think when he left off, he wanted to be brave and wanted to, to have adventures or something, but I'm not sure if he necessarily said the brave warrior of the sea thing. Uh, I think it was these giants, uh, Buggy and... No. Broly? No. Is that... Broggy and Dory, that's it. I think Broggy and Dory, is that right? Broggy the Red and Dory, yeah, that's it. I think he's he's inspired by their story. Basically, these two giants, and giants live a lot longer, so they've been doing this for a hundred years. They go into a fight, and like every day when the the volcano erupts, they go and duel each other, and basically they go into the death. But it's been a hundred years. And they fight like every day or every time it erupts, uh, and no one is best at anyone. They're not. They don't hate each other. They're actually very good friends, and they've completely forgotten what it was that they started fighting about. But like, this is a warrior's pride kind of thing. You know, we fight every day because that's what true warriors do, and we have to keep going until someone wins. Blah blah blah. So this is where Usopp kind of gets that mentality that he wants to be a brave warrior, a brave, honorable person kind of thing. And it also um, introduces the country of Elbaf, which is the giant homeland, which we haven't seen yet. It's, again, when the series was going to be like five years. I'm sure Oda has um, thought up what Elbaf looks like and what its importance is. Like, we have been to Elbaf in flashbacks. Like, Big Mom, um, her backstory is set mostly on Elbaf. Um, but we haven't been there, like the Straw Hats haven't been there yet. Uh, one of the the pirate crews in their grand fleet is comprised of giants from Elbaf. So like, he, he's allied with a bunch of giants, but we haven't been there, or we don't know what its political situation is, uh, apart from the, the very Viking no, n nomad? No, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not sure. Viking culturesque like uh yeah vikings we do know that uh big mom who was the main ish antagonist of the whole cake island arc uh she's there at wano fighting i personally don't think she's going to be defeated i think they're going to beat kaido and like all his soldiers and i think perispero her her son slash first mate kind of thing will be beaten up and her crew hasn't made... I know her crew has been trying to get to to Wano and Onigashima for a lot of chapters. Like they keep getting delayed or getting knocked off this waterfall. So I think she'll realize that like Kaido's been defeated. Like Things are going to shit. I'm going to have to swallow my pride, take my, my son, who's like an a unconscious corpse. My, my ship's here, but like we're not in a position now to fight against these forces that have taken Onigashima. And I think she's going to leave. And I think she'll be important to the... I'm assuming they're still going to be in like an Elbaf arc. This was set up too long ago um, to not pay off at some stage. And the big thing is, yeah, the orphanage that Big Mom grew up on was on Elbaf. And she was kind of friends with the giants, but like even as a little girl, she was not as big as a giant, but still massive as far as humans are concerned and like monstrously strong. And when she got too hungry, she kind of went into these mad rampages. And one time when they were doing like a fast, you know, some sort of religious ceremony where they fast for a certain amount of time, but then they get to eat sweets at the end. She literally went insane and like burned the village down and killed the elders. 
Um, so the Giants kind of hate Big Mom for that because I think they, they killed their two most distinguished old men. And then there was an incident where um, Big Mom likes the old political marriages. And she also has this mentality that she wants all the people of the world to come together and live in harmony. Um, there's a lot about Whole Cake Island that has these disturbing overtones on top of like well-meaning undertones. Like it's supposed to be a place where you can live in peace with there's no prejudice and you know race, ethnicity, whatever. You all just live in 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 harmony under this mad tyrannical childlike dictator. Anyway, uh, I think he's called Loki. He's like the uh, ruler of Elbath. Fell in love with one of her daughters and was meant to like marry her and like Big Mom would finally because there are no giants in Whole Cake Island. Because the giants hate her, but I think she figured that if the the leader of the of the giants married one of her daughters, then that would like build mend the bridges kind of thing. But her daughter wasn't in love with him, and like ran away from the wedding, which pissed the giants off even more. And now, I think the giants basically think it's like unforgivable. Like Big Mom is just a mortal enemy for this. <laughs> oh, not only like destroying our villages and killing our elders when she was a child. Now, like basically this this injustice of, of this marriage that was supposed to go through. So I, th I think Big Mom will be important or relevant to any sort of like Elbath arc that might be coming up. Other than that, they they get to the island and they sp get split up into two groups. One of them meets Broggy, one of them meets Dory, and they, they both independently learn about what they're doing. Again, there's no hate between them. They're just fighting to the death for this honorable duel, but they're still good friends. And we get introduced to Mr. Three. Uh, this dude. Who... Was there a Mr. Four? I think no, there is a Mr. Four later, but we haven't seen him yet. So Mr. Five and Miss Valentine fail. So they call up like the next agent along to, to finish the job. And I think maybe kill kill Mr. Five and, and Miss Valentine for failing. I don't remember. Now, it's kind of funny because I've forgotten a lot about the early One Piece stuff. Like, I, I watched and read some of this stuff literally 20 years ago. And Mr. Three comes back much later as a sort of ally, but in a very sort of comedic role. Like, he does help. Like, he's, his powers are useful. He does do some, like, cool stuff. But a lot of his time is being like a a foil for Buggy and doing a lot of these like comedy routines enough that like I can't take him too seriously but during this this section he's presented as like a really like ruthless assassin powerful scary like he doesn't look it like he looks like a funny character but they definitely play him off like he's a serious threat and he's seriously evil and that, that kind of didn't gel with the more comedic um, version of him that I kind of remember from uh, Impel Down and his his partner is Miss Something. Again, it's much easier just to remember the numbers than to... Golden Week. Yeah, Miss Golden Week. So he, he looks like that, I guess, when he was invited to Baroque Works and became you know the third level agent. He styled his hair like that. Or possibly his hair was like that always. And Crocodile was like, I guess you got to be like Agent 3 now, Mr. 3. And he's like, yep. But his partner is Miss Golden Week, who's like a little girl, just like a little girl, with a paint set. And she's one of the only characters, like, ever, almost, there's a couple I can think of, that has, like, a strange power that does something. But it's not a devil fruit power. So she paints with colours. And depending on the colour, and I think maybe the, the glyph type thing she paints on them, they do different things with emotion, so... I can't remember the exact colours, but one of them makes Luffy, like, indifferent and lazy. Like, he doesn't want to save his friends anymore. One of them makes him, like, laugh, and, and one of them makes him, like, tranquil, so he doesn't... He's not violent, he's not... In the middle of a fight, he just turns completely tranquil and doesn't want to fight anymore. And she does that by just painting on him. But it's not a devil fruit power. It's just her own power, like, her own magic. So there's very few times where someone has, like, a power that does something. And it's not a devil fruit power. It's It's just their own skill for some reason. 
So, uh, Mr... I think it's Mr. Three. Sabotages, like, the ale. Apparently they have a, a huge store of beer on the, the Going Merry that we didn't really know about before. I guess, maybe. But, like, barrels of ale. Because the giant finds them and takes it, or asks for it, and they give it to him, I don't remember. And he shares it with his buddy, because, like I said, they're still friends. So they, you know, he gets some ale, he gives his... his does a sword fight and then goes, all right, you know, we'll, we'll fight later. But look, I found some beer. Have some. And one of them is sabotaged because it blows up after it's been drunk. And it injures, I think it's Dory. I think Dory's the one that gets his insides blown up. But he still needs to fight and he, he justifies it and says, you know, even if I was sabotaged and, you know, all my insides are blown up, that must be the divine will. You know, after all this time, it's the divine will of the gods that I be you know, not able to fight as good. And if I die, then that's that's the reason. Like I've been judged unworthy by the gods, so you know, so so be it. And he does get beat up. Like he he loses his fight because his insides are all bloody. And that's when like Mister Three jumps in. His his power is like wax. He he's a wax human. Um, he can make things out of wax. He can make wax like fly out and do things. And he uses it to I think knock him over and it makes like wax cover his arms and legs and once the wax dries it becomes really hard i don't think wax ever becomes that hard actually um but then again, i only know wax from candles i don't know if wax is used in anything else that i can really think of but yeah they're, they're firm but they're not like st he says that when it dries his his wax becomes like almost like steel i don't think that's real i don't think wax can get that hard but it doesn't matter um he also manages to capture zoro nami and Vivi in this weird thing he makes. It's like a, a giant sculpture with like a spinning pumpkin thing on top. And as it spins, like it spits out bits of wax powder type things. It makes it rain down and it covers you. <coughs> and gradually like covers you with wax and then it hardens and you're a wax statue. Like, I don't know. This is just a timing thing because it shows that he can command wax to like spew like he produces it so it's not like he needs wax to do it like he produces wax and controls it and he can like make it go around you and like solidify into a shape so there's no reason he can't just summon wax to just cover you and instantly make you hard he has to set up this whole weird birthday cake looking monstrosity and make powder slowly rain on you so it hardens over the period of of an hour this is really only just to make suspense because surprisingly luffy comes and um but in the end just basically punches him to defeat them M mr five and miss valentine do turn up um but i know usopp does this thing where he, he sort of saves the day he manages to it's i think it's a rope or something i forget now he gets a rope and he, he runs around and like the rope is soaked in oil and then, like, he wraps it around everything, and then it gets lit and sets on fire, and then causes a big fire that melts all the wax. So, again, Usopp is, like, the MVP of this arc. He manages to save everyone. It's stuff I completely forgot that Usopp did. Um, yeah, they, they wouldn't have actually got that far without Usopp, like, saving the day in a couple of places and doing a lot of heroic things that I completely forgot about. Even though I do like Usopp as a character, I'm liking him more than I did before because he does do a lot more in the story than I remember him doing. Anyway, there's a, a fight, and the good guys win. Uh, we get a scene, because Sanji... Zoro and Sanji, like, made a bet to see who could catch the biggest prey, like, for meat. And as though, although Zoro got wrapped up in this whole giant fight thing, Sanji didn't. He's just been walking around all this time, like, looking for people. And he comes across... It's like Mr. Three's little base he was using before. He made, like, this little uh, wax house. And he finds it and goes in there and he gets a call uh, from Crocodile basically asking him for a progress update because he doesn't know it's not Mr. Three he's talking to. So Sanji tells him, you know, oh yeah, they're all they're all dead. Don't worry about it. And we, we succeeded, you know. We, we killed the princess. We killed the Straw Hats. It's all good. And I think the Unluckies come at this point. And I think Sanji beats them up. But basically, I think I think he buys it. Miss uh, Crocodile, I think, buys that it succeeded. But he does command one of his other agents, Mr. Two, um, to basically go and intercept Mr. Three, Miss Wednesday, and the rest, and knock them all off. 
I think because they're useless, maybe, or... Here we go. His, his real name is Bentham, but his alias is Mr. Two Bond Clay. <laughs> and if you've never read One Piece, you might be thinking, like, that's just ridiculous. Like, that is one of the most ridiculous character designs. Um, but Mr. Two is is close to one of, like, maybe top ten of my favorite One Piece characters. And it, that's true of a lot of people. A lot of people rank Bon Clay, like, quite high. Yes, he's got bare legs, like a pink card, uh, like dressing gown thing. He's got ballet shoes. He's got like all those hair on his legs. He's got, he's got swan heads coming out from each of his shoulders. But he's by far one of the coolest characters in the series. Uh, he, he will be more important next set of chapters. He, he's only sort of introduced as, you know, he gets called to basically intercept Mr. Three and his, his boys to, and kill them. But he'll be back soon. And then that's basically Little Garden. Uh, the giants recuperate. They're actually both fine. Oh yeah, no, they wanted to capture part uh, the the giants as well because they were big name parts. There was like a, a giant pirate crew like over a hundred years ago, and and they rampaged everywhere and they're unstoppable. And for some reason, the two captains got into a fight and basically had to settle it with each other before they did anything else. And that's taken like a hundred years, but they still have bounties of. I think it was 100, 100 million berries was their bounties. And they're still active because, you know, they're still alive. And Mr. Three wanted to, to collect their bounties as well. That was part of his um, plan. Anyway, after they're all beaten, the Straw Hats leave. I think they, they get an internal pose as well. Like uh, the log pose thing, I think I went over that before. The idea with the Grand Line is that each island has like a magnetic field. Uh, when you start off... You kind of choose an island to go to, or you, you, I don't know how you get a log pose that goes to an island, and each island you go to is like linked with the next island. So while you're on that island, uh, you got to wait for the log pose to like lock on to the magnetic pulse of the next island, and it takes a certain amount of time. And Little Garden is like a year. If you go to Little Garden, so assuming like Whiskey Peak, if you chose that island, the next one along in the six in the the thing is little garden and it takes a year and a lot of people die so i'm, I'm assuming that if you chose that path from the start you die for the most part so there you go all the people we see later in the series must have inadvertently not chosen that path and there could have been a lot of other interesting characters that could have been around if um if it wasn't so like hot like little garden itself isn't that bad like there are dinosaurs this is another weird thing <coughs> Like, I guess the dinosaur model Devil Fruit maybe isn't something that uh, Oda thought of or, or knew about yet. Because it makes a big deal that this island, Little Garden, is forgotten by time and, and dinosaurs still roam the earth. But then later on, like, there are Devil Fruits that turn you into dinosaurs. And they're, and they're like, m ancient. But how can they be ancient if there's an island with just dinosaurs on them now? Whatever. Uh, so they, they get an internal pose. So there are, there are these log poses, which are like little compass looking doodads. They're like a permanently set to the magnetic pull of a certain island. So if you need to go straight to that island and you have an internal pose, you can just follow it. Otherwise you have to just follow island to island and hope that the island you want is on that route. Or you kind of just take your, take your chances. So they get an eternal pose for, uh, Alabaster from one of the bad guys. I forget who. So that's, that's cool. They can go straight there. Uh, the giants help them escape because there's a, apparently a giant goldfish off the coast that they they kill. They use this move. Um, what is the move called? Something Sovereignty. And it's got the same naming convention as Big Mom's Attacks. So let's just... No, so Uh, I forget. It's it's Ikaku Sovereignty or something. Um, it's just a, a range attack that they do. But it, it's got the same naming convention as Big Mom's, which is due to Big Mom kind of growing up on Elbaf a little bit. So she she has similar attacks as the Giants. But that's just a little side note 
that's kind of interesting, sort of. Uh, and they kill the goldfish, which is one of the... There's a lot of things that uh, Usopp lied about when he's telling stories to his girlfriend um, that do come true over the course of the series. And um, finding a giant goldfish was one of the lies he told, and it came true now. So the next part of the story involves Nami, because Nami, while she was getting waxed, I think, um, I think when they set it on fire to melt the wax, her little t-shirty thing got burnt off. So there's a little bit at the end where she's kind of just walking around in her bra, and you know everyone's like, "Oh, it's fan service," because you know Nami is walking around with her with her bra and her boobs out. Um, but the the story purpose of this is that apparently while she was walking around with her midriff, not that her midriff was particularly covered beforehand, I think she was wearing like a fairly like midriff bearing top. Anyway, she got bitten by uh, some sort of bug or insect or snake or something. She got bitten by something, and now she's become very sick. So sick that she's not able to navigate properly, and she, she might die. So they have to go looking for... Vivi decides that even though her, her kingdom is in peril, they need to find a doctor for Nami before they can do anything else. This is also... I think there is a line where... I, I made reference before that... At the beginning, the Grand Line is talked up as being like this super dangerous place. And when they first go to the Grand Line, there's like half a chapter where they're like dealing with like rain and then storms and then lightning and then winds and then nothing. Like it's perfect weather and, you know, how and Nami tries to navigate. But like because the weather's so fucked up that like her navigation skills, even though it's like pretty stock standard to like do this to go this way, they get turned around and she's like, what? I, I did this perfectly. Like how are we turned around? And then I said that basically that's never kind of brought up again. They do make a mention that at the start of the Grand Line is when like all the islands, all the first islands, magnetic, like tropical systems or whatever, are all intermashed. So that initial like first part of the sea is like super hard to navigate. But once you pass that, once you like choose your path and go on an island and, and, and follow island to island, each island has like its own weather. Like there's a, a winter island where... It's like winter there constantly, or a spring island. So it's at the beginning when all the islands like mix together. That's that's the problem. But after that, it kind of gets okay. And that's kind of why, that's the explanation why they don't have to like battle all sorts of weird weather and, and stuff every time they leave an island from now. is because it's only that first initial bit, apparently. That first entering of the Grand Line, which is so bad. Yeah, whatever. Um, Then we meet, I forget what his name is. They're, they're sailing along. And they see a guy standing in the middle of the ocean. And they think it's weird. And then a, a big submarine thing pops up. And they're attacked by these pirates. Um, one of them is called Wapo. And he eats things. Like his power is he, he's able to... I can't remember what he is. Paku Paku? Maybe? Like Pac-Man? That's the, the reason Pac-Man eats things. is Paku Paku. It's like an onomatopoeia for eating. I think it's that's what it is. So his devil fruit is to do with eating things. And we'll see more of Apo later on. But I think Luffy or Zoro, I can't remember, someone beats him up. I think Luffy punches him and he goes flying away and like his, his crew has to go and follow him. And they end up on this island. Uh, it's called the Drum Kingdom. And they meet the residents who don't like pirates. But Luffy and friends seem harmless and they've got this really sick person. So I think he's called Dalton. He's like... He was one of the ministers in the previous administration or head of the army or something. And he's basically the leader for the time being. And he decides that, you know, these people are all right. I'll look after them and we'll take... We've got one doctor in this island. Lucky you. We have one doctor. And we will attempt to take Nami to, it, to her. And they don't like pirates because recently they were attacked by pirates. And here we have the first reference and appearance of... Blackbeard, whose name is Edward D. Teach, and his crew of, I think it's only, is it three or four people at this point? I know Lafitte is part of the crew, but I don't know whether he's, I should look that up. Nah, I can't be bothered. I know Lafitte, is that his name? Lafitte, I think, represents like Blackbeard at this meeting of the uh, warlords at some point. So I'm not sure if he's just like away from the rest at this point. I think you only see them in silhouette, but I can't remember if Lafitte's there. Um, 
Now this is just from memory. So Blackbeard, Jesus Burgess is the big wrestling looking guy. It's not Doc Strange, Doc Holiday, Doc something. It's like this really sick looking guy and this really sick looking horse. Uh, it's gonna kill me now. I'm gonna look up what the Blackbeard pirates are called. Blackbeard pirates. Okay, so at this point, <coughs> Teach, yep, Jesus Burgess is that. Van Orga is is that. Lafitte, 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 I think that might be it. Doc Q. And his horse is called Stronger. Uh, I don't know who this guy is, actually. So the other ones, the other members of the crew join much later, but at this point, it's only five of them. Perhaps four, I can't remember. Anyway, Teach is a big deal and, and very relevant to the story as we go on. But this is the first time we hear of him. He apparently came to this island and just wrecked shit up. Uh, scared the king so much that the king basically abandoned the country. And we find that later, obviously, Wapo was the king who, who got scared of these pirates, just abandoned everyone, uh, but then got lost at sea and hasn't managed to find his way back. Um, and that's what Wapo was doing out at sea. And that's why they don't like pirates. And that's why Dalton is kind of the default leader at the moment because... Um, their king basically abandoned them. We find out that the one doctor that they have is called, and I forget what she's called. Doctor. Not it's not Hero Luck. I would think her name is here somewhere. Kuraha. Dr. Kuraha. There she is. She's like 150 or something. But she kind of still looks... She's still got the typical female body that Oda draws. She's just got a couple of wrinkles here and there. Anyway, she's the only doctor. And she is taking up residence in the King's Old Castle, which is on top of this bluff thing. This like massive rock formation-y thingy in the middle of the island. And she stays up there. And she just randomly comes down from time to time to a village where she needs stuff. She just looks around for sick people, cures them, takes random things she needs as payment, and then goes back up to her castle where she just hangs out until she needs something more. Um, and she has a reindeer pet that's important later. So Luffy, sort of not knowing what else to do, decides that he's just going to take Nami and, and climb up to get to this doctor. And Sanji's going with him. While they're after Luffy leaves, they find out that she actually Kuraha had come to a, the next village along. Um, so Usopp and Vivi head off to uh, this village to try and catch her and and tell her that we you need to help. I don't know, go back to your to your castle and wait for Luffy, or you know, come with us and we'll try and find Luffy to stop him before he gets too high, kind of thing. I don't know. But anyway, that happens. Um, Zoro is behind at the, at the ship. Does he wait with, I can't remember actually. I think he's just waiting with the ship. I think someone's there with him, but I can't remember who it is. Nami, Luffy and Sanji are going to try and climb up. Usopp and Vivi definitely go to try and find the doctor at the village she's at. I think, yeah, Zoro stays behind at the ship, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then Wapo comes back. He finally finds his way back to the Drum Kingdom. Um, and he is getting into a fight with Dalton. Dalton has a, a zone fruit, which lets him turn into a bison. And he's going to fight. I think that's pretty much the end of the chapter, where we get up to. So Luffy is going to try and climb up this massive mountain thing with Nami strapped to his back to, to get a treatment. Wapo has just come back to, he, he wants to reclaim his kingdom. And then that's where we leave it. That's where we leave it. Um, not the best set of chapters. Like, Whiskey Peak is all right. It's mostly there to set up that, you know, what who Vivi is and what she's doing and sort of what Baroque Works, Baroque Works is about. Um, they introduce Crocodile. One of the hilarious things is um, there's no sort of bar for bounties yet. 
So Leafy was given a 30,000, no, 30 million, sorry, 30 million berry bounty. Um, and they, they'd say that Crocodile is one of the warlords. And obviously he doesn't have a bounty now because he's like a uh, permitted pirate. <coughs> the government, you know, lets him be a pirate in exchange for his services. But before that, before he was like employed by the government, his massive bounty was 80 million. Which is kind of funny because we, we learn later on, like, Crocodile is, like, well-known with a lot of big players. Uh, he knows Ivankov. He has some sort of history with Whitebeard. Like, he's met and fought against Whitebeard before. Um, he knows Doflamingo. Like, they've had encounters before. So it's not like he hasn't met and been involved with big players. Um, and, and seemingly, like, on their level. Like, I think it's it's sort of implied that Crocodile is sort of on the same level as Doflamingo and some of the encounters they have. But obviously, like, at this stage, like, Doflamingo's bounty, I don't know if it's ever been revealed. But, you know, a lot of the uh, Warlord-level pirates we see later have around about the 500 million mark. Like, that's around where Jinbei was, some around where Ace was when he was invited. Um, so, yeah, 500 million is around about where a lot of the warlords are. And then some of the like Yonko commanders and stuff get towards the high 800, 900 million range. So for Crocodile to have an 80 million is like really, really low. Like the supernovas, they're all the, the rookie pirates that have made it to the, the first, uh, made it to the second half of the Grand Line that have a bounty of 100 million or more. So, you know, there are 11 of them. So getting to 100 million isn't actually that big a deal for like rookie pirates. Like it's a big deal, but I mean, there's 11 of them. So there's, there's not like, you know, there's one, one in a, a generation kind of thing. So yeah, 80 million for Crocodile. I think Oda has sort of stated that that's, he got 80 million before, like because the government didn't really know how bad he was or what he was up to. It still doesn't make much sense. Like really Crocodile's bounty should be, you know, at least maybe three to 400 million rather than 80. That's just a, I don't think um, Oda knew just how high some of the bounties would get as he went along. Um, yeah, so Whiskey Peaks, apparent from that information, there's nothing much special about it. Little Garden is just kind of boring, and it doesn't really introduce that much lore or that much new stuff. And then Drum Island, we've only just got into. So, yeah. Um, Drum Island, from memory, I, I'm not going to say what I think of it, because there's so much I've forgotten about all this stuff. So I have to wait until I read it. But um, we have sort of technically met Chopper now. Uh, he's in his reindeer form. Not his little... Um, I don't know what it is, actually. Because really... Is it is that his human form or is that his hybrid form? Actually, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I've talked about the different types of uh, devil fruits before. Maybe I'll just go over it now. For So there are three types. There's uh, Paramecia, there's Logier, and there's Zone. So Paramecia are pretty much if anything. Anything that has an ability that does something or is something is a Paramecia. Like, it's the most plentiful. Um, it, it, it really covers... There's no really defined thing. Like, there are ones where you, you can turn people into toys. There are ones where you make your body explode. There's ones where it lets you come back to life after death. Like this that makes you turn into rubber. They're all Paramecia ones. Uh, Logia are the elemental ones. They... Again, it's not really clear what counts as an element in the One Piece world, but it makes you take on the properties of that element. So let's say Ace, he's got his fire fruit. So he's essentially made of fire now. So he, he looks like a normal person, but if you try and like slash him with a sword, like his body becomes fire. So like it's like if you try to cut fire with a sword, like it does nothing. If you try and shoot him, it's like shooting a bonfire with bullets. Like what are you gonna do? Um, so he's basically invulnerable because he's made of that element. And he can shoot fire and manipulate fire and all that sort of stuff. And then there's like light, ice, snow, like mud counts, like swamp counts as an element at some stage. And again, I think I might have uh, might have said this at some stage, but like if you're made of mud, that's a logia and that's elemental. But if you're made of rubber, like rubber is as much an element as um, swamp is, surely. I don't know. Like, uh, 
mochi. Like later on, mochi is like a, a, a sticky Japanese desserty type thing. Um, that's paramecia, but it's a special paramecia. We'll get to that way later. But if 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 that's not a zone, then why is swamp is uh, whatever? And then you have zone, uh, which are animal based. Uh, <clears throat> you take on the properties of an animal, and you've got three forms. This human form. So you look exactly the same as you've always done. There's your animal form, where you turn into that animal. So we're talking about Dalton. Um, he's buffalo. No, he's something... Model buffalo. Again, that's a, that's a thing for a zone. Is There's a lot of fruits of the same animal, or the same family of animals, and then it will be model something. So like, there's the bird bird fruit. I'm pretty sure it's called like the tori tori no mi. Model something. So if you, you can eat the bird bird fruit model falcon. As opposed to the like bird bird fruit model seagull. So they're both bird fruits, but you know, you don't just have like the falcon fruit and the seagull fruit. You've got the bird fruit model falcon and the bird fruit model seagull. That's how it works. So there's a lot of um, different uh, types of animals that come into it and they're all model something else. So this, this guy's got like, I'm gonna look it up because I've said it enough times, I need to like, The Ushi Ushi no Mi model bison. So that's the cow cow fruit model bison. So it's possible that like there's an Ushi Ushi no Mi model like dairy cow out there somewhere. Um, so he's a bison. And then, all right, so you've got human form, which he looks the same as always, the bison form, which is just straight up a bison, and then the hybrid form, which is a hybrid between the two. So you can see that here. He's like a, a man shaped thing, but he's got the hooves and he's got the horns and the bison face. And that's that's the same with most other most other zone fruit users. Um, so in terms of Chopper, I forget which is which. And a Chopper has multiple forms because he's he's created drugs to like give him different abilities. But as a base thing, you can tell when he's in these animal form. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, so I'll talk about Chopper next week. What am I talking about? He's not even in it yet. He's been in it. He's been in it anyway as his, his reindeer form. So as far as anyone's aware, he's just a, a normal reindeer that... Um, has been trained and like goes along with the doctor. There's there's one scene where like they're going from the top of the 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 bluff down to a village and it kind of looks like Santa Claus, like a reindeer pulling a, a sleigh behind him. We'll talk about Chopper next week because he'll actually be in it next week. Uh, and like I said, we did get Robin in this. Uh, she's I don't know if I mentioned she's Miss All Sunday, so. In terms of <clears throat> the male operatives of Baroque works, um, everyone's Mr. Number, like from 10 down to zero. So there's a Mr. 10 somewhere. I don't know if we ever meet them. And then Mr. 9, we knew he was Vivi's um, partner. The old butler guy, I think was Mr. something, 7, 8, 6, I forget. And then we met Mr. 5. Anyway, it goes all the way down to Mr. Zero. That's Crocodile, the leader. All the female operatives are miss and then a day. So some of the higher agents have days of the week, like uh, Miss Wednesday, Miss Friday. And then some of the, uh, the higher level agents have holidays. So Miss Valentine. Um, there's a Miss Merry Christmas later on. Um, and Robin, who is basically the highest level female, she's Miss All Sunday. Um, so there's no indication that Robin will eventually join the crew. She's just a strange enigma at the moment. Anyway, I'm going to stop this here because I think I've talked about all I can talk about. Uh, and we'll see everyone next week when we dive into more One Piece. Um, goodbye, everyone.